Crossroads Media. There are three angles that I want to study when looking at this head coach. And unfortunately, you need to be three for three if you have any real chance of being successful. And there's a big old goose egg in the win column for Nick Sirianni in these three specific spots. So he's over right now, and that stings. And it's more than stinging. It raises serious, deep internal questions that Howie Roseman and Jeffrey Lurie need to ask themselves. Oh, no doubt about it. You know, I'm under the impression and don't get me wrong, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but they are so pathetic that these are the real thoughts that pop up legitimately when it gets this ugly. And normally this town runs off emotion and you can see a knee-jerk reaction. This is real. There's substance to it. I don't view this as we're just reacting in the moment. No, no, no. There's legitimacy to wondering what Nick Sirianni can do And this goes back to his introductory press conference that half the fan base despised and the other half was willing to give him an opportunity to prove his worth. But there's something about the way he carried himself that questioned a good portion because it wasn't about what happened when things were going well. It's does that work when it's bad? Does that work when it's tough? Does that work when the entire um, the entire locker room is going through a spiral? Can you stop the nosebleed or does the bleeding occur nonstop and now your entire kitchen has blood? You're, you're swimming in it. You're swimming in it because you can't stop the nosebleed. And now... A.J. Brown and Nick Sirianni beef again. Last week, I was criticizing the wide receiver more than anybody else. Like, dude, be a better teammate. There's legit reasons to be upset if you're A.J. Brown. His last touchdown was against the Buffalo Bills. This guy's a superstar. This guy's insane. This guy destroys opponents. You cannot have him not having a touchdown for this long. Here's the first angle of why Nick Sirianni is a failure right now. His scheme. He doesn't run a professional offense. He doesn't even run a college offense. He doesn't run a Pop Warner offense. He doesn't run a Madden 24 offense. He doesn't run an offense. This is not an offense. This is not an offense. This is not an offense. And I don't know if he accidentally tipped his hand when he spoke, uh, but when he was discussed about uh, that last final sequence of the draws and the field goal and all. It was the day of the game. He thought it was aggressive. The following day on Monday, he said more along the lines of, I could have been more aggressive there. Oh, hold on a second. I? I? That almost tells me a story where he's the one calling the place. Is it Brian Johnson? Is it Nick? Is it this pathetic? Because, well, Brian Johnson isn't even doing it anymore. If we're to be told by Jeff McClain uh, that four weeks ago, three weeks ago, they already yanked the third down callings away from Desai, but we, the public, didn't know until about three or four weeks later, well, then who's to say that they're not already doing that on the offensive side of the ball? Did he tip his hands by saying, I could have been more aggressive there, or is he just not throwing his offensive coordinator under the bus? You have to win that football game and do exactly what Jonathan Gannon was afraid of. Gannon was afraid of you milking the clock out and then winning and not giving them another possession. Well, even if it is an onside kick, find a way to do it. And it almost seems like Sirianni has self-assessed and realized in previous games that, well, you know, we scored too early and gave the ball back to opposing teams, so we were trying to find that balance. And I'm okay with you trying to find that balance. What I need you to do is do it. That's all. Okay, fine. You recognize that that's something that you had in the back of your head because there was once a time where you weren't good with uh, with time management towards the end. But if you don't actually execute, then what the hell do I care that you recognize it? You should recognize it. You're a head coach of an NFL football team. <laughs> All right. Number two, the emotional side. They had how many games highlighted on the schedule this year? What I think they had... Kansas City, Super Bowl rematch on the road against Andy Reid. Kudos to you. You knocked it out of the park. You got that victory. There were three remaining after that. Dallas the following week. San Fran. Oh, no. Sorry. San Fran was after Dallas. So, Kansas City, San Fran, 
Dallas the following week, and Jonathan Gannon's return. You want to ask me how they did in those three performances? Molly whopped all three times. Absolutely destroyed. Blown up. Pathetic. In three of the four highlighted games entering the season. Jonathan Gannon stinks. And he walked circles around you. You couldn't catch him. And my man was tiptoeing at a turtle speed. All right, it's not Usain Bolt and you were trying to catch him. This was the lowest of the low. And he took what he knew. And man, did he make you pay. By an offense, that's garbage. Michael Carter on two different teams. Michael Carter's numbers. Dude, zero carries, two carries, three carries. That's Michael Carter. You would have thought he was Adrian Peterson in his prime. All right, how's this for some numbers? The Eagles' only sacks the last three weeks were by Jalen Carter, Fletcher Cox, and Shaq Leonard. Their last sack from an edge was in Dallas. The last time the Eagles went three straight games without a sack by an edge was weeks 9, 10, 11 of 2007. And that was against the Cowboys, Washington, and Miami. Are you for real? Are you for real? Oh, my God. You can't even make this up. Let's make it worse with the defense. Hassan Reddick, who reached double-digit sacks in four consecutive seasons, dropped into coverage more yesterday than any time joining the Eagles. He had his lowest percentage of snaps as a pass rusher since joining the Burts, a confounding adjustment for a team that needs a pass rush. That's from Zach Berman. And, yeah, man. Yeah, man. These are all real. These are all real legitimate scares. Oh, it hurts. Oh, it's bad. Oh, we can't ever figure this thing out this year. And I stand by that. All right. So, angle so far. Scheme one, the emotional side two, failed in both departments. And then three is the in-game management. All right, timeouts, they don't know what they're doing. They're not on the same page. Uh, It's a third down. They got to call timeout. I mean, it's so bad. And then they don't even know who's on the field late in the fourth quarter. There's one game left, fellas. Ladies and gentlemen, there's one football game left in the regular season, and we're still trying to figure out what plays are happening and who needs to be the personnel. It's totally unacceptable. And there's also an angle here of the roster and Roby and Penny. Avante Maddox is back. Well, he's holding his pec, and he's getting x-rays, which is just problematic. I love the kid to death. I think he's been an awesome eagle when healthy and on the field, but we can't consistently go to that well. He is always hurt. It's unfortunate, but it's real. So Roby's not dressed. Penny is dressed. Penny gets nothing. Roby, you could have probably utilized him. Not that he's a world beater, but you're telling me that he can't go out there when, when, when all these other guys are struggling massively and you're actually betting that Avante Maddox can stay upright being out there as much as he was, I think that that's silly. Uh, You know what I mean? So they don't even put the roster together well on game day, which is, to me, an in-game management thing. Your roster is your in-game management. 